Why are people struggling? It is not because of immigrants. It is not because of Muslims. It's not because of lazy black folks. Legislators are never going to save us. It's the people. It's the power of the people. It's going to be relentless fights. But when you come together, come to the table, and are committed to that goal, impact happens. As Rebecca mentioned, today's event is made possible with the generous funding from LA County's LA versus Hate. I am Sue Abedi and I lead the Hollywood work for the Muslim Public Affairs Council, but the work in entertainment is actually, it's hardly entertainment. It really is about changing the narrative, building authentic voices and giving opportunities to our storytellers um, and also elevating our rich history um, as Muslims, American Muslims and global Muslims. And currently our, our rich history is actively being erased. So it's vital now more than ever. And for the filmmakers in the room, the storytellers, God bless you. It hasn't been an easy ride for you. Um, and it's going to get harder. But we see you and we, we appreciate you so much. And the work you're doing is not for the now. It's for the generations who will never know about the work and the heavy lifting you did. So thank you for that. I am so honored to um, introduce our Panelists, again, the title of this panel, panel, panel one, is Reengaged Strategic Entertainment for Social Transformation. And I don't want to repeat um, what Rebecca said, but it is we're going to be talking about the art of powerful narratives and how they impact social um, change and how they impact perceptions of our communities. Uh, we have three amazing, powerful women on stage right here. They have dedicated their lives to social justice. They work behind the scenes. You need to know them, and hopefully during lunch, you'll get to know them further. The first is Marguerite Hill, co-founder and executive director of Muslim Anti-Racism Collaborative, Muslim Arc. <laughs> Raida Hamida, co-founder of Latino Muslim Unity. <laughs> and Ned. And Nadia Hassan, Senior Advisor and Political Director of Engage California. Your bios are very impressive, and I'm not going to do them justice by reading them, so I want you to take a minute to talk about what you do at your organization and also talk about your body of work before I jump in with questions. And we will start with you, Marguerite, and then we'll go with to Rida, Raida and then you, Nadia, okay, in that order. Hey. Assalamu alaikum. Peace be upon you. And I really mean that during this really difficult time. Our hearts are heavy, um, especially for our Palestinian and Lebanese um, people in Lebanon and Palestine and here on this. I mean, thank you both for being here and being engaged witnesses and allowing us to, to show up in whatever capacity that we can. So my background, um, I am an African-American Muslim woman. There's some things by choice. I chose to be Muslim at 18. Been Muslim for 30, over 30 years. Um, the, um, I was, since I was a student, I was in college, um, and I was a, a student organizer at the time. Um, so it's just seeing certain things play out time and time again over these generations, like over, you know, and seeing new generations experiencing the continual war um, and targeting of the Muslim community. Um, in 2014, um, um, I helped co-found Muslim Anti-Racism Collaborative as a human rights education organization. Um, it was really inspired by that work that um, started in the 90s where um, the specter of the Rwandan genocide um, and also the Bosnian genocide. Um, early on, I had worked with Bosnian refugees, um, you know, and just hearing stories um, from, from folks who had, um, were either dealing with authoritarian regimes or spying, um, dealing with the kind of targeting of our communities. Um, as an African-American Muslim, I had, um, I wanted to understand um, race and racism. So my background, um, I went to graduate school and studied race in Muslim-majority countries, so pre-modern 
Islam in the Middle East, um, but also Islamic Africa. And then my other area of research was on racial identities in um, the Muslim world. So specifically, like I did field work in Morocco, Egypt, and Kuwait. Um, and I brought that kind of understanding, whether of the kafala system, but also, um, you know, and the, the tensions between our communities um, to bear, because I found that for us to address Islamophobia was absolutely imperative that we built stronger lines of solidarity. And one was really coming to terms that our national advocacy organizations really needed to have a racial justice framework, but also be more inclusive and be sure to incorporate and uplift the stories of um, African-American Muslims, of the African diaspora, that that was essential in understanding the fulcrum of white supremacy, which affects all of us, right? So that's a little bit about our background, my background, but I wanna cede um, the floor. Thank you. So now, alaikum. Uh, I'm very proud to be uh, a friend of hers and an ally. We've worked together before, and uh, I hosted a women's summit in Orange County, and she was one of our speakers, and everyone loved her so much uh, for sharing the black Muslim perspective. So thank you, Marjorie, for all your work. Uh, my name is Raida Hamida. I am, uh, I was actually born in Burbank, California, so I'm a California girl. And I went to UCLA. This is my uh, hood. I went to UCLA for um, history and Middle Eastern North African studies um, for my undergraduate. And my um, graduate education was in social welfare, uh, public affairs, so I'm a social worker. And I started doing this work uh, much because of the lack of belonging that I felt when we moved to Orange County. I grew up in LA um, until 11, and then I moved to Orange County, and there was, a, there was just me being the only Arab in the room all the time. And every time I would tell someone I was Palestinian, they're like, oh, Pakistanian, I know that, you know? <laughs> It was, it was really hard. I mean, I think people knew what Jordan was, so I started saying like, oh, you know, I'm from Palestine. You know the country next to Jordan. And oh yeah, Michael Jordan, yeah. Like it was just never gonna connect with them. And so I think one of the things that I wanted to do in Orange County was really create a space that we felt connected. And for years, you know, even in elementary school, I struggled. Um, identifying as Palestinian because a lot of times I would be discriminated if I did um, throughout high school, especially um, you know during the Gulf War. So uh, my parents had my name as Rita, R-I-D-A instead of Raida. So it was really hard because they would call me every single year for like 13 elementary years. It'd be like, Rita Hamida. And I'd be like, oh, that's so funny, Rita Hamida. And I'm like, it's Rita. But my parents did that so that I could assimilate. And unfortunately, like, I didn't like that part. I always pushed back. I always wanted to be who I was. And um, proud of being Palestinian, proud of being Arab, proud of being Muslim. And I started a movement in Orange County in 2017, um, which was because of the Muslim ban and because of the mass deportation at the border. Um, I have a background in history, but my parents also, my dad immigrated to Peru um, and I spoke Spanish. My grandmother's actually Cuban, so I really wanted to build a lot of the bridges between Latinos and Muslims. During that time, there were anti-Muslim, anti-Latino policies. Um, and rhetoric, but also un unconstitutional policies. And so I started a movement called Taco Trucks at every mosque when there was this fear of having a taco truck at every corner. And uh, Marcos Gutierrez was the founder of Latinos for Trump that said, if you're not careful, there's gonna be a taco truck at every corner. And I was like, that's awesome. Let's put that, let's put that in every mosque, another fearing place. And there was a lot of fear around Moss during the time, um, they were really not spaces that people were familiar with. It would be in the middle of Little Saigon, for example, Islamic Society of Orange County, in the middle of a Vietnamese-centered area, or the Santa Ana Mosque in, in the middle of an 80% Latino area, but people did not 
want to engage. And so I said, well, they don't want to engage with taco trucks, and they don't want to engage with mods. Let's bring those two together. And our first event, there was 400 people, and they got to know one another, uh, broke tortilla, and really learned about our similarities. Um, I study history here from uh, 7-Eleven of 1492 in Spain. So I brought that history back to life in our shared culture, our shared food. And um, our second event at the Islamic Society of Orange County brought uh, 3,500 people. And then we did Isla LA, another 800 people. And then we became statewide where we went to Sacramento, Santa Clara, San Diego, even Rosarito. And um, during that time, we were able to get 40,000 people to register to vote. Um, we were able to mobilize people to get vaccinated. 12,000 people got vaccinated through taco trucks at every mosque. Um, and, you know, the work continues right now with what's happening in Gaza. And we were able to get 13 resolutions passed for a ceasefire. Assalamu alaikum. So thank you to IMPAC first uh, for inviting me uh, to be here. I am always overjoyed to join MPAC because I feel like I'm a daughter of this organization, my family. I mean, I think Salam has known me since I was, what, a toddler crawling. Uh, Sue, we've known each other for so long. We go way back. Um, so, and I'm very proud of the work that MPAC does. Um, and, and they, you know, they have such foresight. You know, they saw the need for this work and for uplifting the stories and changing the narrative long before any of us knew that this was going to be a need uh, for our com community. And for that, I'm truly grateful. I'm also grateful for all of you for being here, for giving up your Saturdays. Um, you have to forgive my voice. I um, have not slept in days. Um, right now, my ancestral homeland of Lebanon is being, yesterday, was pummeled um, with bombs. My family in the south of Lebanon um, has been displaced. There were bombs dropping around uh, my uncle's home. So I'm having, I'm having extreme anxiety right now. And um, you know, just not able to focus, not able to think straight, not able, I mean, my, our hearts were broken over Gaza. And then it's like when you think that you can't break any more than, you know, than this. And um, so, so alhamdulillah, I have faith. Um, you know, we keep praying. Uh, but I really wanted to check in with all of you. Like, how are you all doing? Like, really, how are you doing? Yeah, so we need to stick together. This is the time where we need each other. I know I need my family, my community. So um, again, um, I'm going to stick very close to my notes because I want to make sure, because I can talk about this situation till 4 p.m. and I want to make sure that I stay, that I that my mon mind doesn't wander. But um, just to talk about a little bit about my work, as Sue said, I'm the political director and senior advisor for Engage. Uh, we're a family of institutions. We're a political action um, committee and uh, we're, we're, we're a family of institutions. Uh, through our C3, we do voter mobilization, voter education. Through our C4 work, we do lobbying. Um, right now, Engage is on the Hill every single day in and out of congressional offices, calling and demanding for a ceasefire, asking to condition aid to Israel, asking for an arms embargo, uh, asking to restore funding to Anarwa, asking to let the, the, the humanitarian trucks in. Um, I mean, that's, you know, that's what we're doing right now. It is the number one, it's not the only humanitarian issue we are advocating for, but it's the number one issue that we've been really focused on for the last year. And um, I'm so proud of our policy team. Um, we also have a PAC and a super PAC. I'm the political director for the PAC. We endorse candidates. Uh, we try to align. Uh, we, we try to support candidates who are pro-humanitarian. Um, and who represent the values that uh, that that will re represent us in in government? So um, it's hard work because it's a lot of research. I have to do the research. I have to, you know, we have to assess viability whether it even makes sense to support this candidate or not. There's a lot that goes into as a political strategist to um, to determine whether we're going to support a candidate or not. And then we have our IE independent expenditures where we've spent uh, the last. 
you're trying to support our members in Congress, our allies in Congress, like Jamal Bowman and uh, Cori Bush and Summer Ali, where APAC has targeted these candidates, and they're literally spending millions and billions of dollars trying to get these candidates out. And they were successful. They took out Jamal Bowman from New York, Cori Bush in Missouri, and alhamdulillah, we were able to save Summer Lee through our super PAC. We, we raised a good amount of money for her. We did digital ads. We did, um, uh, you know, uh, different type, types of um, independent expenditures and to, to promote her candidacy. And she was able, we were able to save her during the primaries. Um, how did I get into this work? Um, I'm still trying to figure that out. I really don't know, you know, my background, I have an MBA in business, uh, my second master's degree is in strategic communications. I, this was not part of my plan. I did not plan to work in politics, um, but I think, you know, since 9-11, there was um, a series of events that, that manifested in my life, which I, maybe I'll talk about a little later. Uh, and you know, this is this is where, this is, I guess, my calling and what Allah wanted me to do, to stand up, speak truth to power, um, you know, fight justice because that's what, uh, fight against injustice, sorry. Um, that's what we're called to do, you know, as Muslims, as people, as humans with a soul, with a heart, people who feel we're supposed to stand up and protect each other. And so this became my calling. Uh, if someone would have asked me, you know, many years ago, what do you want to do? This definitely was not in my deck of cards. So alhamdulillah, uh, just a few more things. Um, you know, most uh, most folks in, in Southern California know me for the coalition that I started in 2016, I'm sorry, 2011, uh, where the Tea Party was, was um, really pushing, uh, was really uh, uh, pushing their anti- um, Muslim, uh, you know, their smear, ca their smear ca uh, casting campaign against the Muslim community. Uh, we were being, you know, we were being heckled. We were being smeared. Uh, so I started a coalition. Um, of course, I didn't know, you know, I had no experience in, in organizing at the time. Started a coalition and alhamdulillah, uh, we were able to work with, um, you know, with our partners. We were able to, to build a movement. Uh, that resulted in the removal of a council of the councilwoman, one of the um, the Tea Party's in, Tea Party members in Orange County. Alhamdulillah, and it was that was really the the thing that kind of launched my political uh, career forward. I then uh, moved to D.C. and I uh, started working on campaigns. I worked on Hillary Clinton's campaign uh, and worked on a number of congressional campaigns um, and got my experience. Uh, there and then uh, I was under in 2016. I'm sorry, 2018. I was appointed by Republican Governor Larry Hogan uh, to serve on a commission for the Middle East and American Affairs. And then in 2023, I was appointed a second time uh, under Governor Wes Moore uh, to serve as the, the governor's office, uh, the director of the governor's office of Immigrant Affairs. So, Alhamdulillah, I was, you know, I've seen the policies, I've seen the work from both the public se sector as well as the nonprofit and the, the uh, private sector. I've been able uh, to work across these sectors in order to, um, to mobilize uh, our community and bring people together uh, to, focus, to focus on strategic goals and strategic objectives. And when we are able to do that, when we're able to come together, I found that the greatest power is when we come together and align on a common value. And, and that's really the beauty of, of this work. And I think later we're gonna talk about grassroots uh, organizing stuff. So I'll stop right there. Yeah. Well, thank you. Just, I wanna do, I do wanna acknowledge the, the moment we are in history, it's, these are very heavy times, but wow, how cool it is that we're alive to change, to change things if we can. And I'm a big fan of Stephen Covey, and one of the things, one of the habits is begin with the end in mind and just to understand that we as an ummah and as a community and those who are um, um, treated unjustly will be fine in the end. And then also the Quran says that God says that he'll give us resources to change our condition when we least it, in, expect it. And all three of you are resources to that end. So thank you for everything you're doing. I am in awe of everything you do, all of you. And I'm going to start with you, Marguerite, if that's okay with you, if that's okay. Um, when, we, when we consult in entertainment, we're, we're, always asked, we're always asked, well, tell us about the Muslim community. Tell us about, you know... Tell us about you, and we're like, well, not we're not a community; we're communi 
communities. And there is no other community in America that has been vilified than the black and African-American community. And thank God for Muslim Ark and for what you do, uh, Marguerite. Um, and so at Muslim Ark, um, you provide, can you provide examples of the education that you do? Because you have a whole curriculum, from what I understand, and how you have successfully changed public perceptions through mm -hmm. that education. And, mm -hmm. and how, if you may, can you, just one more question, I hope you remember. Um, and how do you measure that? Measuring impact. So I'll, yeah. I'll start with the, I mean, well, we'll start with measuring impact as far as education, right? Like that is really the challenge, right? And, and I want to really emphasize the importance of public education, of having the kind of critical analysis and why it's so important to do anti-racism, like anti-racism education, because we have narratives, right? We have media, we have bad political players who are pitting us against one another. Mm -hmm. And that's always been the case since 1619, right? Of pitting communities against one another um, because it benefits those who are like, whether they're like the major corporations, right? Like, so people are blaming immigrants for what they can't have. Like they're, they're, we're struggling with paying rent and then making narratives up around Haitian immigrants saying that they get $9,000 just for coming and there's free free rides for everyone. So when we're able to have the critical analysis, right, and but also understanding like who's benefiting from the the lies, the prejudice, the tropes and everything, that's that's so important. Um so what um, doing a human rights education organization with a specific focus on um, building the capacity within Muslim and allied communities for racial equity has been a major shift for us. In 2014, most of the ways that the Muslim community was addressing anti-Muslim oppression, whatever that we want to call it, whether we want to call it Orientalism, whether we want to call it anti-Muslim racism or Islamophobia, a lot of that did focus on education and dealing with the myths around Muslims, the misinformation. Uh, there was so much of this post 9-11 energy around proving Muslim humanity. We're just like you. Well, for one third of American Muslims who are African American and descendants of those who were brought here under, who were kidnapped and brought here under chattel slavery, like my great grandmothers, we were wet nurses. We're also part white, also. Like we have deep familiarity, and, it, and the familiarity and the saying we are human beings, you can raise, you can even raise your own future oppressor, the person who owns you that there were people in this, this system, in this society, who had their own children and sold their children to get free. Alexander Dumas' great-grandfather sold his, his uncles. So that is how messed up white supremacy is. Well, who does it benefit? So, so this is when we're thinking about anti-racism education, of understanding this isn't just, we can't just do the systems change work thinking that hey, if we tell people we're human beings and we focus on, on um, showing them this is the myth that you have about us, but this is the truth, while that is still very important, we have to recognize that there are people that directly benefit from disseminating those lies because it can justify three different things that still exist in this world today, which is, which is colonial occupation, settler occupation, militarism in wars, right? And economic exploitation, that there's people that benefit from that and they have to weave stories of who's acceptable as a human being to mistreat, right? And so that's the real core of doing anti-racism work. It's like, yes, there's some well-meaning people, like they don't know, they're buying into the lie and we have to do the kind of education for, for them to understand that, hey, what they're saying about these particular groups you may you need to understand why they're telling those narratives and who those narratives benefit and recognize the harm that it does all of us. That racism hurts white people just as much as it hurts black people, just as much as Latinos, Asians, 
Arabs, South Asians, Pakistan, like all the ethnicity, we're all harmed. Native American folks were all harmed by it and we're all exploited by the lies of that. So doing anti-racism work of bridging, of understanding how the systems work, it's so important that we focus on how the stories that we tell about ourselves, whether we see ourselves as, in, in, as superior or inferior, a lot of our communities internalize inferiority mm -hmm. and that we have to do that work and truly understand what is wrong in society? Why are people struggling? And it is not because of immigrants. It is not because of Muslims. It's not because of lazy black folks, or it's not because of scheming this group or that group, but that, that there are corporate interests, right? There, there are the, the ruling folks, who the 1% that own a lot, and that they have an undue influence on our elected officials. And the thing is, is like they may have money power, but we have people power. Mm -hmm. And that when we're able to take a hold of our own narrative, then we're able to see that and we don't have to align with their interests, especially when it harms all of us. That's the core of anti-racism. Can you talk a little bit about how, just some curriculum information that mm -hmm. you have and then how do you measure impact? Like, how, how is it that you do measure that? Yeah, okay, that's, that's good. So then, so one of the things that we, we found was like a common narrative that in 2014, what we saw across the news was one of, of making Muslims into a monolith, mm -hmm. this kind of brown monolith, but also really focusing on two countries in particular as representative of now two billion Muslims which is like either Iran or Saudi Arabia as representative of all of us, right? And not to say that they don't, like there's so much diversity in both of those countries with their beautiful people and everything. Love, love it. Want to go there, you know, especially, you know, to, to both places. But when you, when you tell the story that Muslims are a monolith, any race, the fact that Muslims globally, two thirds are in Southeast Asia, Right, And then in American Islam, one third of American Muslims are African American, right? And so, but also when you think globally, that there are more Muslims in Sub-Saharan Africa than in the Middle East, right? So what does that mean, especially if they're telling the stories that only focuses on the Mediterranean or the Middle East and of, of just collapsing all of our identity? So when we launched Being Black and Muslim, which uplifted the narratives of black Muslims, that helped to shift the narrative of really highlighting the importance of who American Muslims were. Now, what that did was not erase Arab Muslims, South Asian Muslims, but what it did do was counter the narrative that Muslims are a foreign threat, that Muslims have always been here, even before there was a country. So when we uplifted the blackness of American Islam, we did not have to prove our humanity or sense of belonging, that we belong here because we are part of this, the fabric of society, but we were also part of indigenous uprisings, indigenous freedom struggles, of the abolition struggles. So when we weave that kind of story, and this is why it's going to be important, the, the documentary on American Muslims, go watch it. It's coming out really, it's coming out in a few weeks. But understand that story. And when you see things like the Omar opera, and, you know, these kind of stories shift the narrative and shift the kind of policy where they stop treating us as a security threat, but as, part, as partners in building a pluralistic society. How we measure the impact has been the shift in the programs. We look at the shift in the narratives, right, that, that are coming out of Muslim communities, right? We look at the, and our partners of who they're partnering with. Even visually, as they talk about American Muslims, of including much more of that nuance and where they're not just conflating us with one particular ethnic group, but reflecting the diversity of that. Impact can show in the ways like the publications and how many people we're training, but I've seen so much growth in the diversity and pluralism in Muslim majority um, organizations, but also in who is being representative um, as far as the Muslim American stories and so we're kind of measuring that, but then there's a lot of intangibles that we're still enjoying and benefiting from over the past 10 years. Thank you, thank you so much. And, and the 
one third, because initially I heard, the last time I heard it was a quarter or so, right? And the fastest um, growing um, community in, in right now is the Latino Muslim community as well. Um, and you have been doing the tacos and trucks and through storytelling through all that. Can you talk about your grassroots storytelling with your with the community and the the impact you've made and how you measure success and also include um, the freeway sign, which you didn't in your introduction, by the way, oh, which yeah. by the way is, you know, when you talk about storytelling, a lot of times it's also subliminal where you're not necessarily reading something or watching something, but a sign can, you know, just kind of get, you know, something on, on a sign, a billboard will be ingrained in your mind. So can you talk a, a bit about your grassroots effort in, in changing perceptions for the community? I actually first went to Vermont Mosque, and uh, I call it Vermont Mosque, but it's the Islamic Society of uh, Southern California. And Dr. Mahmoud Hathout was uh, one of my mentors. I was only seven. I was super young at that time, but I didn't realize the magnitude of like having him as a mentor at that age. Um, and so I, I think that you know that really activated every every Sunday we would go to. Uh, the masjid on Vermont um, near Hollywood, and I that's how I identified it, and then like really felt proud to be Muslim. Um, and then we'd always pass by, um, because we lived in Monterey Park, we passed by uh, King Taco, which was <laughs> really a big deal at that time. It was like the only staple, uh, like taco place that we wasn't Taco Bell or Del Taco it was is King Taco. And my parents would take us there after the masjid every single Sunday. And those little things, you know, started to plant seeds of a movement. I didn't know, but they were just a culmination of things. And so one of the things my parents did, even though they lived in Monterey Park, um, was that my dad had a business in the city shopping center in Orange, and we'd, he'd have to drive every single day about 45 minutes to that area. And while we would spend our Sunday, um, you know, in his business, he would also make us go to Al Taibat, which was a market in Little Arabia, now known as Little Arabia. But at the time, it was like in the 80s, it was the only market, Arab market, uh, where you could buy halal meat, which halal means permissible in Arabic, and the meat is um, prepared in adherence to Islamic law. And that was one of my, another like imprint on me, because I would be like, hey, you know, I'm Muslim because I went to the masjid. That's how I identified. And then I love tacos because my parents took me to King Taco. And then I would also go to shop um, at... Al Taibat, and I remember stealing like little Turkish delights from these big boxes, and my face would be all powdery. And the owner, um, uh, my uncle uh, Karaki, would always say, "You're still stealing. You're still stealing." And I'd be like, "Yeah." Years later, I went to um, my parents moved to Orange County. I went to the Islamic Society of Orange County, or so actually Orange County, so ISOC, and which is again the second largest mosque in Southern California. And I started the student council at Orange Crescent School at 12 years old, 13, like started the first yearbook. So these were like little things. And then my, the driver that used to pick us up from, um, from our home was Ahmed Alam, and he was a developer in Little Arabia. Nobody knew that at the time. I was like 12 years old. We'd drive in his truck, all six of us um, at the time, and then his three kids and he'd drive us to Orange Crescent. My parents live in Anaheim Hills. He lived in Yorba Linda. And he would pass by every single day. Uh, he'd take us through the 91 and then exit um, on Brookhurst and make us go this long way to Orange Crescent. I'm like, Amo, why are we taking this long way? He'd be like, because I have a vision. See that land over there? I'm going to build a whole shopping center. It's going to be Arab town. And I was like, OK. <laughs> And again, another imprint, and just years later, fast forward, I started working at Access California Services as a social worker, 
and I met up with some activists and we were all talking about designating Little Arabia because at the time there was only two businesses. It was um, El Taibat and Kareem's in 1996. Um, and then, you know, fast forward 10, 15 years later, like there were 70 business, businesses. And as a social worker, I did all the dirty work. I did all like the 5150s, um, domestic violence, child welfare issues. But I said, no, I want to do something now that really uplifts our community. And I started this grassroots movement um, with uh, three or four activists to really advocate for designation uh, for Little Arabia. While doing that, we were doing a lot of voter engagement because people started to identify, elected officials started to identify with Little Arabia and say, hey, this is an economic powerhouse. Like, we want your endorsement. We want to be, you know, please put our posters on your windows. And so we would go with the electeds or with the candidates to the businesses. And eventually we'd ask also, hey, we want you to vote in support of a designation. It took years. I mean, it was like 26 council members we went through. Um, from 2014 to actually, th actually 2004, I was at UCLA and I took students from our Arabic intensive class all the way to Jurier and we did a whole little Arabia tour. So it's been quite before that. But in 2014, one of the things we were doing was also like trying to get these people to, to win for office through little Arabia ad like advocacy. And so we'd ask them, like, are you going to support and ad advocate for Little Arabia if you become an elected official? And they'd say, yes. We're like, okay, we'd give you your endorsement. And, um, you know, those people didn't usually win, unfortunately, because that's how it usually works. But one of the things we did do was like, okay, so Little Saigon's next door to Little Arabia and advocated for Little Saigon and Little Arabia to be a tourist, a tourist attraction. And that was really big because then that's how we built a coalition with the Vietnamese community. And you have to find things that you both benefit or both our communities benefit from. And at the time there was a, there was a candidate for mayor and he was like, wow, can you also get like the Arab vote for us or the Muslim vote? And I was like, I don't know, let's see, let me, let me look at the PDI and let's look at the numbers. There weren't a lot of, he was a candidate in Garden Grove for mayor. There weren't a lot of Muslims in, um, in regards to the voter files that were actual voters. I think there was like 246. And, but he won by 11 votes. 11 votes, and that was 2014. And I was the one that literally picked up the Muslims by like just literally, I took my parents suburban and like started picking up uh, voters and we w took him to the polls and then they he won um, and he he beat like a 20 year incumbent a white male for 20 years and so I think like this movement of now taco trucks at every Muslim everything that we're doing is just like a culmination of all the advocacy because it took like till last week for the actual sign for Little Arabia to be put up um, Can you just talk a little bit about it? Yeah, so that yeah. sign basically is supposed to be now the legacy of the Arab American history of, of California because it's not just like a designation in Orange County, but it's the first of its kind in all of the country. Even though we have huge Arab um, populations in Dearborn, and actually quite honestly, it's way more dense um, in Dearborn and in Chicago, but they have not actually advocated um, the way we have. And it took really um, activists to like keep pushing, keep pushing. But if we didn't have, you know, the history and the work that we did with the businesses, I think like that was really our vision is like, how can we keep these businesses in business, right? Because what we noticed with Koreatown down the street, there was a designation, but the businesses had already gone. And we waited how many years since, you know, 1983, you know, to 2024? 20, that's, that's how many years we waited. But the vision obviously was far beyond, you know, just a designation of a, 
of a sign. I think the most important thing that you know, at the time, there was a mayor that was really corrupt. Um, he had, like, dealt some uh, agreements with Angel Stadium, and he was prosecuted um, because he told angels, like, if you give me a million dollars, I will support your deals on council. And it took till that man was actually, like, out of office because we would talk to him and we would advocate, you know, Harry, like, his name was Harry Sudu, can you please support? He was, like, one vote. We had four and we needed five because there were seven. So it's, like, five for majority. And actually four. Uh, we had three and we needed him. And it wasn't until he went down, so it wasn't even really like, sadly, it was just timing, you know? He went down and there was a lot of conversations about him saying to Arabs that, you know, you don't do enough for me. You haven't done enough for me. What have you done for me? And instead of saying like, Arab Americans are like economic contributors to the city of Anaheim, he would say, what have you done for me? And I think that's one of the things that I really want to say is legislators are never going to save us. It's the people. It's the power of the people. Like she said, it's going to be the relentless fights. And finally, when he was gone, there was just like this void. Oh, we don't have to ask for permission to vote for Little Arabia anymore from Harry. And everybody started feeling like everyone for themselves, and then they really just had to report back to the community, and there was a transparency process now, like, everyone had to ensure that, every council member had to ensure that they would be reporting back to the community, not to a, a mayor, and so that really was the segue, I mean, all as a community, even though there was a lot of infighting with community activists and stuff, for the first time in history, we all stood together against these seven council members. They saw us that we, they, that we were united. It wasn't about our ego. We came together and we said, look at us, we're all together now. You have to support this designation because they were pinning us against each other. Like, oh, you didn't, did you talk to Ryda? Ryda doesn't feel this way. Or did you talk to this person? She doesn't feel this way. And that's really what they do in politics. They divide us mm -hmm. and they say, you know, I support this person and they become the gatekeeper. But in this regard, we were no one was a gatekeeper. We just stood in front of seven council members and we got it unanimously supported with the exception of one. And um, it was really a powerful experience because I think the idea is that we never gave up. Yeah. And also it sounded like standing together was you had one narrative and they couldn't divide that narrative. A hundred percent. And that's the other thing, these narratives that we see that are divided, watered down, um, used against us, um, is slowing us down. But what you, in this example that you just gave is that one narrative, one voice, which is not always the case. I mean, I think it's not just one narrative, but it's like one community. Yeah. Sometimes you have to be, put your egos aside and say like, whoever, do, who, who cares who gets credit for this? Let's do this for the community. At the end of the day, like this is for the community. And I think it was two things. It was one narrative in regards to the, the visual effect. Um, you saw all of us together, but it was also us putting our egos aside and saying like, I don't care if I don't like this person. I don't care what this person did to me. Like this is the bigger scheme of things. This is gonna be the legacy for all of us, right? Including these businesses. And I think in organizing, I have to say, it's the most thankless job in the world. You know, like if anybody wants to go to community organizing, you really have to have thick skin. You cannot care to be liked because we have a saying like you never have um, best friends, you have best interests, right? So one day your friend could be your enemy and your interests will still be the same and you'll find the most unlikeliest people support you and you're like okay well this is a complete stranger but hey well we're on the same page so I think that's really what's important is just putting the community first yeah and I just want to because I do want to get to Nadja what is now moving forward what is this going to do for the generations what the work that you're doing now what is it going to do for the generations including that sign and I, I keep harping on the sign because I grew up in America I'm an immigrant to the country and had I seen a sign like that when I was eight or nine or going to Sunday school, which I hated, 
it would have meant it would have meant like a morale boost, and the story would have been different in my head. So, can you talk a little bit about how a sign on a freeway is changing perceptions, not just for our community but for others? I mean, it definitely humanized the the Arab American community, and it's the highest. And it was perfect timing again because. 400% increase in hate crimes within the Arab and Muslim community, uh, according to CARE. Yet, like, this was the first win for us. Like, Little Arabia sign, when I drive by, and I live off Burkhurst, by the way, I actually live in Little Arabia, so every time I drive by, uh, I'm reminded, like, hey, I belong, I matter. So, like, all of these children that I, like I said, early in the very beginning of my intro, I didn't feel like I belonged in Orange County. I didn't feel like I had a safe space that I can call my own. I think the humanization, the narrative now that the Arabs are one of us, that we are not just economically driven, but we're also electorally driven, like our vote's gonna matter. And I think that our children, like my child now is 25, and he decided when he got married that he wanted to live in Little Arabia. How powerful is that? Because he felt so connected. He's like, this is the best place. I get, I get to wake up on a Saturday and go have breakfast at Kareem's. I get to go shop. And I felt like that connection, that root, because my parents were born in Palestine. I was born here. I wanted to make sure that my son also felt connected to his roots. So he went to school in Islamic school too, but now it's like he wants to be part of a community. He doesn't have to want to. There is a community for him. Yeah, absolutely. And talking about measuring impact, like even when you got it down to 11 votes, you knew your work came down to 11 votes. That's how you, you know, you can measure impact that way. So thank you. Um, and so Nadja Hassan, and I um, go back a long way. We were childhood friends, and we did go to um, the Islamic school on Brookhurst in the early 80s, and we were the bullies and the troublemakers. Oh. Don't you dare I change. was not the bully. Yeah, don't she you was. dare. Um, we didn't. I followed whatever she said. We did not want to be there. We, we snuck did not out want of, to. Yeah, yeah we, we snuck, snuck out, out a lot. All the time. And we were the troublemakers. We weren't bullies, but you know what I mean? We just kind of like navigated out of campus and everything like that. I wanna, can, if but, I can't say, you know, go Dr. ahead. But I, I want to ask you the question because yeah, I want to give you your I time. I just want to remember Dr. Maher Hathout and the, the doctor, actually both Dr. Hathouts, because they were so instrumental in everybody that I know, everybody that I've met in this work, in this across the country, who went to the the Vermont Masjid, and we do call that the Vermont Masjid, had they had left such a profound impact on their lives. Every person that I know has gone, that has attended, has been in their presence, attended the Sunday schools, attended the ski trips, attended the retreat. I mean, they made being Muslim fun. They, we wanted to go to the masjid. And that wasn't the case with all mosques. I mean, unfortunately, I'm not trying to... I didn't, I didn't, I didn't get that because I went to Orange County. And so... Yeah. I, but I did have the benefit and the honor of working with him. So I, you're right. Yeah. Just yeah. amazing, yeah. amazing impact. But go ahead. I wanted to... Uh, yeah. I wanted to, and I want to just dial back the whole bullying thing. We only bullied... We only bullied people <laughs> when, when, when they told us something was haram. And then we were just kind of pushed back on that whole haram thing. And that was the only time we really bullied. We weren't really mean. No, we were we, just outspoken. We were outspoken. We were outspoken. Yeah. That's all. So, we still are. Yeah. And Ned. A clarification. Yeah. <laughs> but no, I mean, that whole thing. And I just wanted to just say, you know, about the halal store. I just want correction. My family um, and my mom and dad started Tariq's, a halal food place, in very early in, the, in Fountain Valley. And every weekend we'd go and help them and I have to say it sucked it was the worst thing it was but it was part of it was part of me witnessing how I'm perceived and 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 looked at and otherized and it helped me now when it has but I just want to say I live that life the halal food life I mean I actually made a living out of it I mean because well, I honestly Never thought halal would be something that would be like a teaching educational piece. Absolutely. But and like now, like when I go to, I even, I, I did a tour of Little Arabia yesterday with uh, LA Taco, which is a news, piece, uh, news um, reporting agency. And I took them 
through uh, Little Arabia, then I stopped by at Islamic Society of Orange County. I was like, oh, there's the taco superhero. I'm like, I am not like the taco lady. Please, I do not want to be known as the taco. Like, the halal taco lady. But literally, they wrote on the New Yorker that I was trying to make the halal taco the new kosher hot dog. So that was pretty awesome. And I think we need to make that. Absolutely. So that it's not just a sign, right? It's the food to humanize all of us, to make us feel connected, and to be proud. Absolutely. And honestly, it works, and it's subliminal. Like, I can only eat kosher hot dogs because they answer to a higher authority. So <laughs> tell me that storytelling that is not powerful. Awesome. That tell was me. It really... Are these stories? Yeah. How many people, like, I mean, growing up, right, like knowing like the importance of stories that reach us that affirm our identities, yep. but just even knowing like your fan, like you were part of getting the halal food, like that story needs yeah. to be told. Yeah. So, whoever's the directors, we need those short films, we need those. So I think because it's life affirming, but also my daughter can appreciate. She needs to learn to appreciate what she has. Absolutely, right now. and no matter how much they, whoever they are, hate us or want to hurt us, they still line up to at the halal carts in New yes. York, and and for two hours, I'm witness to it because I stayed in line for two hours. You know, like I'm telling you. Your work, all your work matters, and it, the small stuff like the food matters. Oh, yeah. We, we love saying we fight hate one halal taco there you at go. a time. There you go. Like, so thank you for that, and thank you. But I do want to give Nadia. I want to give my childhood friend um, the last um, question for, it, for your work in Engage or your body of work. So answer it however you want to answer it. How does storytelling uniquely to you contribute to mobilizing communities and influencing poly policy change? Because you've been at it for forever. And how do you impact impact change and impact yeah change? Because we do have to talk about impact because we have to talk on the return on investment of our time and our money and all that. We have to work smarter, not harder. So how do you do that? Okay, so... Um, <laughs> I feel like I've made a career out of this, <laughs> uh, really. Um, you know, just trying to figure out what the best strategies are uh, in terms of changing the narrative, pushing back about against hate, Islamophobia. Um, you know, has been a uh, uh, my life's. I've dedicated my life's career uh, to doing it, and really, it's by trial and error. Um, I, you know, I had mentioned that in 2011, you know, we started the coalition, uh, which um, both of my sisters spoke to in terms of the power of the people. And when people come together uh, around a single common goal, uh, it doesn't matter how different we were. I mean, we were working across the aisle with Republicans and Democrats, and even the Army people came out to support the movement uh, because it really was about no hate. We were not going to tolerate hate in Orange County. And um, and so, so when there is a goal, when there is a strategic objective, and the community agrees to put whatever, all their differences aside, it doesn't matter what faction of Islam you come from. It doesn't matter what your ethnicity is. It doesn't matter what language you speak or even what religion you are. But when you come together, come to the table, and are committed to that goal, impact happens. Change happens. And does anybody remember, not only in 2011, 12, and 13, I mean, I was at it for like three, four years, but in 20, after 2013, starting actually 2014, does anybody remember what happened to the Orange Curtain? Because we were, we were standing up to the, the, you know, Orange County was very conservative, very conservative. And that Orange Curtain... Everything I mean, was haram. Everything, everything, everything was haram. Everything was yeah. haram, exactly, just like we saw at, at yeah. Islamic school. And so, you know, we were dealing with, with the alt-right, you know, uh, who didn't like us, who hated it. But it wasn't that they only didn't like us. They didn't like blacks. They didn't like Latinos. They didn't like, you know, disabled people. They, they, there's a whole slew of black and brown and marginalized communities that they were spewing hate against. So so uh, does anybody remember, is anybody from Orange County, does anybody remember what happened after 2014 to the Orange Curtain? 
slowly but surely, one by one, the congressional districts started flipping from red to blue. And then we started seeing that blue wave. And that was a result of the community mobilizing and community organizing. But we had to stay committed to that. The problem is, and I'm gonna, and I'm gonna bring, you know, I'm gonna bring this to, um, you know, for those of us who do work in politics, it's very lonely. Um, it's a very lonely path. You know, every four years, mashallah, the community comes out and, you know, they participate in the, uh, you know, the uh, election wars and the candidates, you know, and they everyone in divisive politics and, oh, we should support so-and-so and we should not support so-and-so and it's haram. And I'm even seeing spiritual manipulation, religious manipulation used in this cycle, in this election cycle, 2024, where they're saying, if you vote for this candidate, it's haram, you're gonna burn in hell. And I'm like, really, wow. I didn't realize that that was a religious edit. So, so this is what is happening. But then what happens on years one, two, and three? Where are we? I don't see anybody. It's a very lonely space. It's a very lonely space. And you know what? Our cousins do a great job of such a great job of organizing their community. The other day I was watching an interview uh, for Congressman Thomas uh, Massey, the Kentucky Congressman, who said every Congress member in Congress has an APAC babysitter. And that struck me. I was like, really? I was like, why don't we have an Arab or Muslim babysitter? Why doesn't every Congressman, Congresswoman, and Senate member have an Arab or Muslim babysitter. Why do we have to wait until there is a genocide unfolding under our eyes to realize how much of a disadvantage we are at? And so, you know, in the work, alhamdulillah, you know, I have been able to work as an organizer, you know, you know, and I'll say not all the candidates I've worked for, I agreed and aligned with their policies. It's a, it's a very, it's a very difficult um, path, but the, the, the most important thing when it comes to political strategy is understanding that the path that you take is the one that's gonna yield you the best political outcome for your people and for your community. And right now, we are sitting in an impossible moment, an impossible moment, where some of our communities are like, you know, some of the, some of our uh, 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 Muslim brothers and sisters, they're like, well, we're just going to vote for Trump because, you know, we can't, we can't support the Dems right now. And we're going to vote for third party and we're going to vote for whatever. And like I said, there's been a lot of religious manipulation around that. And, and it's not that any one group is right or wrong. It's that we haven't learned how to come together and strategize and develop strategies and be effective. Like, our, and our, again, I'll say this again, our cousins are very good at this. They know how to work together, strategize to, to achieve a particular or specific or desired outcome. We haven't learned to do that yet. We're not even a voter block yet. Candidates don't take us seriously because we haven't organized and mobilized enough so that, you know, and, and they kind of come around every four years for our votes and our, for our money. But then when we need them to move the needle on specific policies, they don't take us seriously. You know why? Because we don't take each other seriously yet. What we've done at Engage is we have a national uh, voter database of Muslims, okay? We can go into our database and how, this is why we're very effective at, uh, at our organizing efforts, because we can go in to any district, any congressional district, even right down to the local districts, and we can pull up the names, addresses, phone numbers of the Muslims that live in that district. Actually, recently under uh, Omar Ricci, I don't know if he's here or if you guys know him, but he reached out to me and asked me to participate in the, the LA Ceasefire Coalition. And what Engage did for that coalition is we 
paid to text every single Muslim constituent in districts two, three, and eight. And, and we did a call to action to let them know they need to reach out to their representatives and let them know they need to, uh, uh, they need to sign on to that uh, Los Angeles ceasefire. So we paid for that. And, and, and these are just some of the tools that we have that where we're able to use data to impact elections, real data, across the country. We, our focus now for the 2024 election is on the swing states. We have, um, we have seven uh, state chapters and we primarily work in swing states, but we operate in 14, actually now in Nevada, 15 states across the country. And we're growing and our team is growing. So, uh, but, that, but that's how we, um, we've been able to impact elections and that's how we are pushing policies because when we go in to speak to the candidates and we go speak to the elected officials, we tell them, hey, listen, I'm, I'm doing this right now in two congressional districts in, in Orange County, where I'm telling them um, in District 47, hey, you have 12,000 constituents who live in your district. If you don't come out and make a statement on the ceasefire, I'm going to make sure, and we are going to make sure as a community, as a collective, that we don't vote for you. So this is, this is how we're getting their attention, by the data, by the numbers, and, uh, and, and by the power of our, our community. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, thank you, and thank you. And thank you all on future generations for standing on your shoulders. God bless you. And um, we don't have the luxury of slowing down, but we do have the luxury of taking time off and getting some rest. So remember, it's, we're, we're, we don't know where we are in what chapter we are in our book, but we need to also preserve our mental and physical state of mind because we still got to keep doing the heavy lifting. Pray for the people of, of course, Gaza of and course. Lebanon, yeah, please. Yes. please. We, of, they need our prayers more than anything right absolutely. now. Absolutely.